Today, we're tackling a topic that can be a bit of a mystery even for us SLPs, aspiration pneumonia. It's a condition that's often misunderstood, misdiagnosed, and even a bit feared. But don't worry, by the end of this video, you'll have a much clearer understanding of what aspiration pneumonia is, why it's such a challenge to diagnose, and what we can do to prevent and manage it. Hi, I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist since 2008. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders, and I'm the founder and CEO of the MetaSLP Collective and MetaSLP Education. Author of the best selling book, So You're Having Trouble Swallowing, and host of the Swallow Your Pride podcast, which has over 5 million downloads. Welcome, I am so glad you are here. Aspiration pneumonia, an elusive beast. I once had a patient that was an older gentleman with Parkinson's disease. He arrived at the hospital for the second time in just a few months with the same exact symptoms as his first visit. He had labored breathing with a bad junky cough and a worried frown etched across his face. His breathing was shallow, each inhale a struggle. The diagnosis was pneumonia, again. But the underlying cause remained a mystery, casting a shadow of uncertainty over his care. His anxiety, just like his respiratory rate, was starting to rise. We'll come back to this patient in just a minute, but first, let's talk about aspiration pneumonia. It's like that unexpected house guest who shows up unannounced and overstays their welcome. You don't know how they got there and you're not quite sure how to get rid of them. They disrupt your routine, make a mess of things, and can be incredibly difficult to evict. Even though aspiration pneumonia can be incredibly difficult to diagnose, that doesn't make ignoring it a viable option. It is a serious and often preventable condition that is having a terrible impact on a growing number of people as the population ages. Since diagnosis is difficult, that means misdiagnosis is easy and happens often. And a misdiagnosis means we are going to treat the wrong condition, leaving the true problem there to persist and grow out of control over time. So what is aspiration pneumonia? It's an infection in the lungs that develops after you aspirate, which means foreign material like secretions, food, liquid, or even vomit enters your airway and goes into your lungs. This can lead to inflammation, breathing difficulties, and even life-threatening complications. Now you might be thinking, don't we have pulmonary defenses to prevent this? And you'd be right. We do have a cough reflex and respiratory defense mechanisms that help protect our airway. But sometimes those defenses aren't enough, especially if someone is weak, frail, and susceptible to infection. So how common is aspiration pneumonia? Well, it's tricky to pin down exact numbers because it's often misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed. But here are some statistics that might surprise you. Pneumonia is the number one cause of infection in hospital admissions. Over a million people are diagnosed with pneumonia each year, with healthcare costs exceeding $10 billion. Aspiration pneumonia accounts for anywhere between 5% to 15% of all pneumonia cases. But that number can be much higher in certain populations, like elderly hospitalized patients where it can reach up to 80%. And here's the kicker, aspiration pneumonia is deadlier than other types of pneumonia. The mortality rate can be as high as 70% depending on what and how much is aspirated. This is why accurate and timely diagnosis is so critical. The diagnosis dilemma, why is aspiration pneumonia so hard to pin down? Let's go back to our patient for a second. He was seen by a seasoned pulmonologist who was determined to unravel the mystery of this patient's recurring pneumonia. She knew aspiration pneumonia was a possibility, but the lack of a definitive diagnostic test made it difficult to confirm. The symptoms could easily mimic other conditions, and the standard tests like chest x-rays and sputum cultures weren't always conclusive. It was like trying to navigate a maze with constantly shifting walls each turn leading to more questions and answers. One of the biggest challenges with aspiration pneumonia is that there's no single universally agreed upon definition or diagnostic criteria. It's like everyone's playing a different game with slightly different rules, leaving us all a little confused and a lot frustrated. Some doctors diagnose pneumonia based on where the patient was when they developed symptoms, such as community acquired versus hospital acquired. Others are based on whether they were using a ventilator, such as ventilator-associated pneumonia, and still others based on the type of microbe causing the infection, such as bacterial or viral. 
Of course, there are many other ways to diagnose pneumonia and a ton of overlap between each definition, which is just hurting my head to think about because it means a seemingly endless number of variations within this diagnostic process. This lack of consistency can make it really difficult to compare research studies and to develop standardized treatment protocols. It's like trying to assemble a puzzle with pieces from different boxes. Nobody's idea for a good time, except maybe my kids. Even when we focus specifically on aspiration pneumonia, the diagnostic waters remain murky. There's no gold standard test, and doctors often rely on a combination of factors. Things like medical history, has the patient had any previous episodes of aspiration or pneumonia? Do they have any conditions that increase their risk of aspiration like stroke, Parkinson's disease, or dementia? Respiratory status. Is there any history of respiratory disease such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD? Are there any signs of respiratory distress such as coughing, wheezing, or shortness of breath? Chest x-ray. Does the x-ray show any abnormalities in the lungs? particularly in the areas where aspirated material is likely to settle due to gravity. Blood tests. Is there evidence of an infection, such as an elevated white blood cell count? Sputum culture. Can we identify the specific bacteria causing the infection and determine if it's likely to have originated from the mouth? Even with all of this information, diagnosing aspiration pneumonia can still be like trying to catch a shadow, no pun intended. Chest x-rays can be difficult to interpret and sputum cultures aren't always conclusive. And sometimes the symptoms of aspiration pneumonia can mimic other conditions like heart failure or COPD. We're just getting started and you're going to love what's coming next. If you're liking this video so far, hit that like button and subscribe to catch all of my future videos on medical speech pathology. And don't forget to ring that notification bell so you don't miss a single one. Now I know you're probably thinking, but wait, I have questions. Fire away. What's on your mind about aspiration pneumonia and how can I help? Let's chat in the comments. I'm here for you. And before I forget, stick around until the end. I've got an awesome freebie waiting for you there. The SLP's role, shining a light on aspiration. So where do speech language pathologists fit into all of this? Well, we play a vital role in helping to identify and manage aspiration risk, which is a key piece of the aspiration pneumonia puzzle. SLPs are the go-to experts in swallowing function, and we have a variety of tools and techniques to assess how well someone is swallowing. We can conduct bedside swallow evaluations where we observe someone eating and drinking different consistencies. We can also perform instrumental assessments like modified barium swallow studies or flexible endoscopic evaluations of swallowing. These instrumental swallowing evaluations allow us to get a detailed look at what's happening inside the mouth and throat during swallowing. We can see if there's any aspiration, how it's happening with what types of food or liquid and how much material is entering the airway. The best part? We can teach the patient how to utilize compensatory strategies to stop that aspiration risk from happening, or at least to minimize the risk. This information is incredibly valuable for doctors who are trying to diagnose aspiration pneumonia. It can help confirm or rule out aspiration as a contributing factor, and it can guide plan of care discussions and treatment decisions. For example, if we identify aspiration during an MBSS or fees, we can work with the patient to try different swallowing strategies, incorporate rehabilitative exercises, or modify their diet if necessary. We can also educate patients and their families about the signs and symptoms of aspiration and pneumonia and what to do if they suspect that it's happening. By working collaboratively with doctors and other healthcare professionals, SLPs can help to shed light on this elusive condition and ensure that patients receive the best possible care. Let's come back to our patient for a minute. The SLP saw the fear in his eyes and heard the tremor in his voice. Observing him struggle with thin liquid trials and noticing his weak cough, the SLP knew we needed a clearer picture of what was going on. The MBSS confirmed the suspicions. He was grossly aspirating. While this wasn't the best news, the team felt it was a step in the right direction since now at least the team had a big part of the answer to his recurrent pneumonias. And our patient? Well, he saw it as a complete breakthrough. With targeted antibiotics, compensatory strategies, and a trial period of thickened liquids with free water, his condition improved. Even better was his relief of knowing what was happening and having a path forward. 
His lungs stayed clear as his mind in the coming months. The relief wasn't just his, but was also shared by his family and the medical team. So there you have it, a closer look at aspiration pneumonia and the important role that SLPs play in its diagnosis and management. It's a complex condition, but with careful assessment, collaboration, and a bit of detective work, we can help patients stay safe and healthy. Join us. The Medical SLP Collective is a community of passionate SLPs who are dedicated to answering tough clinical questions just like this and improving the lives of people with dysphagia and other medical conditions. We're sharing knowledge, collaborating, and supporting each other every step of the way. Visit our website to learn more and become part of our growing community. As a thank you for making it to the end of this video, I'm offering a free resource on deciphering lab values from our site to get you started. See the link in the description below and thanks again for watching.